All right, so it is time for the fabulous Sarah Morris. Sarah Morris is um, also known as the Tudor Travel Guide, and many of you will have seen her 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 posts and her blog and she's on youtube and she's all over um sarah i am going to make you the um choo -choo 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 -choo, i'm going to make you the co-host so then you can share your screen okay thank you so, so welcome to TudorCon. I'm so glad you get to be here because you probably would not have been here if we were together in person so this is a benefit of um covid and of the weird world in which we live that we get to have you here with us. I know. Um, so thank you very much for being here. And I'm so excited to hear your talk because this is all brand new research that you've been doing just over the summer, right? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, and it's um, a bit of really good time travel. So I'm, I'm imagining all you 169 people out there just relaxing in your armchairs, in your living rooms, in your dining rooms. And hopefully I'm about to take you on a virtual adventure in time to Scotland. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But OK, so as Heather says, I am indeed uh, the Tudor Travel Guide and, and I am, as you say, Heather everywhere. Um, and yeah, today I want to talk to you about um, Mary Stuart, of course. Now, we also mostly often refer to her as Mary Queen of Scots, but she herself called herself Mary Stuart. So I'll be talking about both of those characters, both of those names today. Because as my title of my uh, talk says today, there is something about Mary, isn't there? Um, now, if you know me and you're familiar with my books, you'll know that my historical heroine has for a long time been Anne Boleyn. But story of Mary Stuart equally fascinates me and I think that's because you've got you know you've got two female characters they're both really fantastically interesting protagonists and their stories are enshrouded in passion and betrayal and life and death drama and I mean <laughs> that makes for a cracking story right you don't need anything more than that so in search of Mary Stuart, in between a window between one uh, COVID lockdown period releasing and the next wave, which is just about to hit us, I did manage to escape north of the border into Bonnie, Scotland for my own adventure in time in search of the Scots Queen. Um, now, if you know anything about the Tudor Travel Guide, you will know that um, my passion is about talking about Tudor places and artifacts as a means of connecting us with our Tudor heroes and heroines because you know I, as, as my co-author of my In the Footsteps books and I say you know when you visit a Tudor place it really is only time and not space which separates you so you have this incredible ability to to touch the wall and if Rebecca I don't know whether Rebecca yes she is still here I remember talking to Rebecca Larson about Sudley Castle and how excited she would be to go and touch the walls and kiss the walls I seem to remember Rebecca um, and yes I have done that myself and so um, yeah there's I don't think there's anything that gives you quite that sense of connection than actually going to visit the places that these people visited or called home so in this lecture I'm going to relive a little bit of my uh, Tudor adventure, or Stuart adventure, I should say, north of the border. And I'm going to tell something of Mary's story, but primarily through four key locations which were associated with her time in Scotland. And that's Linlithgow Palace, Stirling Castle, and Jedburgh, the market town of Jedburgh, and Holyrood House. Now, um, I don't know how many of you are in love with Mary, Mary Stuart or have visited Scotland. You might want to put something in the chat about that. I can't actually see the chat as I'm talking. I've got my slides in front of me and I've got a few people over on the right hand side. So I, I certainly can't see the chat. So I'm really sorry about that. But it'd be interesting to know how many people of you have visited any of these places that I'm going to be talking about today. Okay, so I'm going to try and coordinate slides with talking, which is, is quite a feat, but here we go. So, um, oh, we should be going. Here we go. I think I might have to use this. So, of course, here we are. Um, Mary Stewart, the lady had just been talking about, and our first location today is Linlithgow Palace. So, here we have the majestic Linlithgow Palace. So, um, it's sited um, about, what, 50? 
15 miles northwest of Edinburgh. And as you can see, it's surrounded by this glorious inland lock. Now, uh, it's a med uh, the ruins of the medieval palace exist today, but actually it was a replacement for um, a, a, um, a medieval castle, which was um, had been built on site, gosh, for, for, for many centuries. And this Renaissance palace that you see in front of you here was actually built around 1420, 1430 by James I, but it was virtually finished by the time of Mary's grandfather's death around 1513 when he was killed at the Battle of uh, Flodden Field. And it was built in the height of Renaissance fashion um, with a lot of French influence. So much so that when Marie de Guise arrived in Scotland and saw Linlithgow for the first time, she said she had never seen more a princely palace. And of course, Marie de Guise came from the Loire Valley where, uh, well, I mean, she obviously knew what she was talking about because if you visited the Loire Valley, you will know that there are some spectacular Renaissance chateaux there. So the palace which emerged, and like many royal palaces, they evolve over time, uh, was built around a quadrangle that you can see today. Um, and you can still see the remains. There is a substantial ruins. The four remains still, uh, the four ranges still remain, although they are roofless. Um, and um, basically you have this quadrangular building and this, the range that is over there on the left hand side was the last range to be completed and that was built by James IV for his new bride Margaret Tudor of course the sister of the future Henry VIII and um, if I just show you I keep moving my I've lost my oh there you go. I keep losing my little cursor there. Um, so in fact, that's what this range looks like. This is a reconstruction that you can see if you visit in Lithgow today. It's a view of a cross section of the royal apartments as they were around, as you can see, April 1512, when Mary's father was born. And, you know, it's typical of any royal 16th century palace of the day. So in this instance, you have the king's lodgings on the first floor, the queen's lodgings on the floor above that. And you have this sequence of rooms which goes from the right hand side, the very public rooms, the larger rooms, progressively through this sequence of smaller rooms, usually from a, a great chamber into maybe a presence chamber. And then depending on the number of rooms within the castle, you might then have a smaller privy chamber. And at the far left hand side, you have the bed chamber, which was the most private part, usually associated with um, closets. Um, I just say actually that if you do subscribe to my blog, the second day freebie is a guide to how to read a Tudor house. Um, and as I say, that the template here, both in Scotland and England, was, was fairly similar at the time. So if you're intrigued about the fact that actually you can read a Tudor house and learn a lot about how the rooms were used, and that really helps bring them to life when you visit these places, then as I say, if you subscribe, you'll certainly get that as part of your welcome to the blog. Okay, so what about Mary and um, Linlithgow? Well, the relevance of Linlithgow, of course, was the place that Mary was born. The 7th or the 8th, either date is given of December 1542. Now, um, of course, um, she was just six days old when she inherited the throne, so she was at Linlithgow. Her father had visited her mother, Marie de Guise, who you can see here sitting under her canopy of estate. Um, before Mary was born, Marie de Guise was heavily pregnant. Um, the, the Scottish king had just suffered enormous defeats at the Battle of Solway Moss. He was a broken man. He stopped by to see his wife on his way off to Falkland and um, si uh, and, and literally, um, si uh, you know, sort of six days after she was born, he received news that um, it was a girl and he'd said, you know, it came with a lass and it'll end with a lass, meaning that, you know, the Stuart dynasty came in with a girl and 
looked like it was going to end with a girl. Well, that didn't quite happen. But anyway, he turned over in his bed and died, uh, making Mary Stuart queen at, as I say, just six days old. Now, she was, um, if you visit Linlithgow today, you will see that just opposite the main entrance to Lin just Linlithgow, so almost just uh, just adjacent to it is the church I think St Michael is the name now um, when we were there Covid still had a number of places locked down including the church so rather frustratingly I couldn't get into it but this is where Mary Stuart uh, was baptised um, now moving on Yes, yeah, so just to say, because some of you might want to know kind of what happened to Linlithgow and did Mary use it much during the rest of her time in Scotland? Well, um, actually, Linlithgow wasn't one of her favourite palaces. It had been the favourite of her grandmothers, Margaret Tudor, and as I say, Marie de Guise was very, very um, fond of Linlithgow, and both of those queens spent considerable periods of time there. But Mary Stuart did visit Linlithgow, but she tended to use it more as a hunting lodge, kind of coming and going. And, and I suppose in terms of the events that crashed through Mary's life, um, the only other notable one was the fact that it was when she was lin leaving Linlithgow as an adult that she was abducted by James Bothwell, um, uh, sorry, James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell um, at Linlithgow Bridge, which is not too far away from Linlithgow. She was heading back to Edinburgh. Um, but um, <laughs> I don't know, you, there must be some Outlander fans in the audience tonight. Um, and if you're thinking, that oh, looks familiar, um, that's because um, Linlithgow doubled up for Wentworth Prison in series one of Outlander. And the reason it's in this state it is today is because it was indeed occupied by English troops uh, later on and um, they left fires burning in the palace and the whole thing caught fire and um, yeah, there you go. It lost its roof and it fell into uh, disrepair. And interestingly, one thing to note about the, um, the castles and palaces in Scotland, which are somewhat different to England, is that in England, um, a lot of the royal palaces were lost um, principally because of this English Civil War and they fell into decay and the English Civil War often saw the end of them. There was no appetite to keep them going um, or they were converted. They were updated and then converted like you can see at part of Hampton Court. But in Scotland, when the Stuart Kings left Scotland, these palaces were almost left like memorials in time. And so you, you can still see a lot of the palaces that do exist still very much have their 16th century feel, which is quite interesting. Okay, moving along now, we're gonna talk about the second location we're talking about tonight. And that, as you can see, is Stirling Castle, the mighty Stirling Castle. Again, I'd be interested to know if any of you have visited. Uh, it is quite a sight. it is perched, uh, high up on this rocky outcrop of land, as you can see. Um, it was in the 16th century, well, right through the medieval period and into the 16th century, it was a very important place strategically in Scotland because it was situated, well, a further 15 miles inland from um, Linlithgow, so around about 38 miles so northwest of Edinburgh. It was on the only main road that ran from Edinburgh to the Highlands and it was right on the edge of the Highlands. It commanded a major river crossing. Um, so it was very strategically very important and it was said that to hold Stirling Castle was to hold Scotland. So as you can imagine in the early medieval period it had a very very bloody history um, but it is a beautiful um, part of the country in Scotland and quite a magnificent sight as you see it here. But why is it involved in Mary's story? Well, um, shortly after uh, Mary was born, Henry VIII, who was still on the throne in England, began to think it might be a good idea if he could get uh, Mary Stuart bound in a union with his, with his then five-year-old son Edward and he was really trying to replicate that the pact that his father had managed to pull off with Mar between Margaret Tudor and James IV. Um, so um, he began to court uh, Scotland and he, he managed to get the Scottish to sign the Treaty of Greenwich which would have bound two, uh, two youngsters 
in a marriage pact. However, Marie de Guise, of course, was French, and there were a certain number of other nobles who weren't so keen on the idea of that union. And um, after a lot of kind of um, prevaricating, eventually the Scottish Parliament failed to, 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 to kind of ratify the treaty. Henry VIII was furious, and he began a campaign that became known as the rough wooing of the Scottish Queen. So various sending armies to incursions into Scotland. Um, yeah, so Marie de Guise, of course, was afraid for her daughter, was afraid that she would be pinched by the English. And so she managed to get her moved. Um, I won't go into the details, but managed to get her moved further inland, further away from the English border into um, into uh, Stirling Castle, and um, Marie de, uh, and Mary Stuart was really going to spend the next five, four years of her life there. So, in many ways, you can call Stirling uh, the childhood home of Mary Stuart. Now, the castle today is an extremely popular tourist destination. If you say, "Have you been to Scotland? Have you been to Stirling?" People go, "Yes, yes, 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 yes. It's wonderful," and. Um, it's, it is, I think, one of the reasons why it's so popular was because quite recently, a lot of the main buildings, including this building, which you can see in front of you, which is the Great Hall at Stirling, was refurbished. And um, the Royal Apartments were also refurbished to be done out as, as if they were uh, occupied by Marie de Guise during the 16th century. So you can actually see a set of royal apartments as they would have been in their 16th century splendor. Uh, this hall um, was actually originally, it was built by James IV, again, for the arrival of his new 13 year old English bride, Margaret Tudor. And interestingly, it's, it's absolutely vast. I walked into it, I don't know what I was expecting, but I walked in and it was one of those, oh, wow, moments. So this huge hall, which has to be as big as Hampton Court um, easily, I would say. And this is the high end of the hall with the Oriel window, which has the most magnificent views out over the countryside. But the hall actually is also quite reminiscent of um, El the one at Elton Palace. And it, and it is, um, I've, I've read that it's sort of been suggested that the design of the hall was in fact based on Elton and came as a consequence of the Scottish delegation who had gone to England in 1486 to negotiate the marriage treaty between Margaret Tudor. And, uh, and James IV and they came back and they thought mm, that was good I'll build this. So when Margaret Tudor arrived maybe she had a bit of a sense of home because of course she'd spent a lot of her time at Eltham. Significantly for us um, Mar uh, Mary Stuart was crowned at um, Stirling Palace so she had been at Linlithgow for about 10 months she came to Stirling in the July of 1543 and in the September uh, she was crowned in the chapel there at uh, Stirling. Now sadly the chapel that exists today, so the main um, uh, royal apartments at the centre of the castle, you have an old royal palace block, you've got the, um, the chapel, the hall and the later royal apartments all centered around this inner courtyard. Now the chapel you see today is actually not the original one that Mary Stuart was crowned in. Sadly, I think it was replaced slightly later on in the 16th century. Um, but, and in fact, you'll see if you look at this picture that little, uh, little Mary is bawling her eyes out. In fact, when we were up there in Scotland, uh, we got shown around quite a lot by folk from the Mary Tudor Society, uh, it's not the Mary Tudor, the Mary Stuart Society, who are amazing guides. And um, they were telling me how uh, little um, Mary Stuart had bawled her eyes out through the whole of the coronation ceremony to the point that they'd actually shortened it and cut some bits out. She was making such a racket. Anyway, ac directly across from the chapel is the, um, they call it the, uh, yeah, the, just the royal apartments, the, royal, the apartment block that was built by James V. As you can see, this is Mary's father. And James IV, James V were responsible for a lot of building around this period um, uh, of, of the palaces, palaces and castles that I'm talking about today and that, that still survive. 
So this, um, you, you go into these royal apartments through this fabulous door. I couldn't resist this little selfie with the door, but it's not quite a selfie, but um, uh, this is the original door. So this is the door that Mary Stuart would have been brought through on her way across, directly across the courtyard to the chapel over the far side of the courtyard. And this is one of the doors that gives you direct access into the royal apartments. And um, what you've got, just as similar to Lynn Lithgow, it's a, um, a, the apartment block is four ranges arranged around a central courtyard called the Lion's Den. Nobody quite, I don't think anybody quite knows why, whether it did involve lions or not, I'm not entirely sure. But you had the King's apartments wrapped around one side, this time and the Queen's wrapped around the other, rather than them being stacked one on top of the other. And this beautiful, beautiful recreation has been done, as you can see. Now, again, you've got the same arrangement as you had at Linlithgow. You have what's called the, um, the outer, um, I think it's called the, the outer hall. This is the outer hall at Stirling. So it's the first chamber in the series of three. Um, yeah, I might just, just say for a moment, because it is quite an interesting fact that I enjoyed finding out about in my research about the Scottish court. The English court during the 16th century, when it was, uh, you know, at its height, had about a thousand people as part of the court, whereas the Scottish court only had around 300 sort of permanent members of court. So it was a third of the size. And consequently, when you go and visit the um, castles and palaces, they the, the royal apartments tend to have less rooms, less in the sequence. So you hear again, you have these three rooms in sequence. You've got this outer public dining chamber then followed by what's called another outer chamber or you might i suppose in if you were looking at an english palace you might call this a presence chamber it was a place for it was a public place you know there would be dining there would be entertainment there would be receiving of ambassadors you've got the cloth of state here which mary de guise and mary stewart after her would have sat under uh, well not that particular one but it gives you the impression of of how that that room would have been looked and used and then you move through straight through there into the the final main chamber in the sequence of three, and this is the bed chamber. Uh, now it's all, it's like a privy chamber, so um, that would be the equivalent in an English palace. This is called the bed chamber or the inner chamber. You can see there's the bed of a state. It's almost symbolic actually. They wouldn't normally have actually slept in that bed. There would have been smaller closets that would have been associated with these private chambers which had probably much smaller intimate more cozy beds and that's often where they would have actually slept but this was a place for entertaining um you know family or close friends or writing your correspondence as you can see here okay now the only thing i just want to say before we move on from sterling is although it played a very important part in mary's life as a child it was really as i say her childhood home um, she would return to Stirling very frequently as an adult after her return to Scotland from France in 1561. And um, of course, it was really here that she fell in love with the man who would probably change her life for the worst. And that, of course, is uh, Henry Lord Darnley. Um, Mary had met him before and had been acquainted, reacquainted with him in Scotland earlier, I think it was February, in the February of 1565, um, but it was in the later in the spring of 1565, when they were at 1565, when they were at Stirling, that uh, Henry would fall ill and Mary would nurse him intensively through that illness, even visiting his chamber after midnight, which was quite, quite scandalous. But by the time they were finished, the two were madly, passionately in love and Mary would be married to him just two months later and at Holyrood and will, as you know, be coming on to Holyrood. OK, so that's Stirling. Um, and so we're going to our third location, which is Jedburgh. Now, you may be thinking, oh, Jedburgh, that's not really one of the main places associated, Mary. Why would why would I want to talk about that? Well, I want to talk about Jedburgh because it was at Jedburgh that Mary had her near death experience to the point that it was actually believed she had died and her funeral arrangements had started to be made 
So in other words, she was struck down by what remains today a very, very mysterious illness. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that maybe in the chat a bit, because one of the things you might not know about me is I'm medically qualified. I used to be a doctor. So the medical history of Tudors, although I haven't written a lot about it, is quite interesting to me. And I found this particular episode really interesting. So Jedbra, what about Jedbra? Well, where is it for a start? So um, Jedbra is... I think it's about 20 miles inside the English in the English border. So it's in what's called the borders. And um, it, in the 16th century, it was a particularly lawless part of uh, Scotland. And, uh, and, and it, at the time in question, and we're now around the autumn of 1566, where Mary decides to come to Jedburgh. And she decides to come to Jedburgh because of, uh, there'd been uh, this lawlessness had had uh, been exerting a kind of a pressure on her authority in Scotland, so she decided to hold what's called a court of Oyer and Termina. Now you may have heard of that before, and actually interesting. I feel I feel a bit late to the party on this, but I I recently realised that Oyer and Termina comes from the French Oyer et Termine which means to listen and decide, which of course is what they were doing. They were listening to cases and deciding the outcome. And so um, it was all set that she would come to Jedburgh, I quote, for the trial and punishment of all loose, disorderly and traitorous persons. Uh, Mary was at Edinburgh at the time and she basically um, sent forth her, one of her right hand men, so you probably recognise um, James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell. He would certainly play a major part in uh, the latter part of Mary's time in Scotland. But she, as Lord Lieutenant of the area, said, go forth, young man, and um, sort, sort the way out ahead of me, which he duly did. And a couple of days later, Mary left Edinburgh for Jedburgh. Meanwhile, um, around where Bothwell had been, he'd been out sort of chasing thieves and murderers and so on. And he'd happened to come across a guy called John, quote, John Elliot of the Park, who was a notorious thief and murderer. And the two of them got into a skirmish and Bothwell shot the bloke in the thigh. But he did, this guy did die, but not before he set about Bothwell with a two handed sword. So and uh, caused quite a considerable amount of damage to the point that it was thought that he was going to die. Bothwell was going to die. So they put him on a cart and they took him back to his nearby castle of Hermitage. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to go to Hermitage, so um, I've had to steal this image. Um, but this is Hermitage Castle. You, I think you can still, you can still visit it, I think, today. Um, so this was around the 7th or 8th of October. Meanwhile, Mary has arrived at um, Mary has arrived at uh, Jebra and she starts um, with her court and she receives news that Bothwell has been badly wounded. Uh, now, some historians, or if you read on the internet, you may quite you may hear the story that she dropped everything and ran to Bothwell, and this was a sign they were already in love, even though they weren't yet married. But in fact, Mary completed. The, the business at Jedburgh and didn't leave to visit uh, Bothwell until the 15th of the month. So um, what happens is, is she jumps on a horse with a few of her courtiers, pegs it over to um, Hermitage Castle, which is, whoa, where are we here? About 24 miles from Jedburgh. She sees Bothwell, who must be getting a bit better by this day. She stays for two hours and then she rides back again. So that's a 50 to 60 mile round trip in one day. And it's believed that on top of the stresses of that year, and 1566 had proven so far to be a pretty stressful year. There was the whole Darnley stuff. There was the murder of Rizzio, which we're going to come on to shortly. And then, of course, she'd given birth to her son in the June of that year. So she'd had a pretty horrendous time. When she got back to Jedburgh, meanwhile, back in Jedburgh, uh, this, by the way, is the Mary Queen of Scots house at Jedburgh. And before I continue the story, just to tell you what you're looking at, it's thought that this is where Mary stayed uh, when she was in the town. There's a bit of debate about whether this is, was the original building 
or whether it's a slightly later building that stood on the site of the original tower house. But anyway, today it's, it's as you can see, it's a museum to uh, Mary Queen of Scots, got all sorts of interesting things. Unfortunately, once again, COVID meant it was closed. So I had to admire it only from the outside. But the real point of the story is what happens when Mary gets back, because as I say, this is where it gets really, really interesting. And it's a shame, really, if you read about this account online, you'll probably hear the same fairly top level story. Mary drives to Hermitage, she comes back, she gets really, really ill. She nearly dies. She gets better. It's all over. But actually, like many things, if you can dig out the contemporary letters that were flying around at the time and you get some first hand eyewitness accounts and you go back and read those stories, sources you start to get a much richer more interesting picture of just what happened so if you crave my indulgence i'm going to tell the little bit of the story but i'm going to be reading snippets from two or three different sources and these were men around mary at the time which tell this story so when mary got back on the 17th by the 17th of october her, her physician reports that she was suffering from left-sided abdominal pain. And then, and, and her, her physician um, diagnosed that she had a disorder of the spleen. She then vomited 50 to 60 times. And one of the letters that's written says, she swooned and lay as dead for the space of two hours. Then the fever became so violent as to deprive her of her senses, i.e. she couldn't see or hear. So she's, she's like going into a comatose state. Um, and then a little bit later, the French ambassador writes, we begin to have more hope of the Queen. For present, the doctors have no fears. She has vomiting after what she takes, i.e. after she eats or drinks anything, which is a little troublesome. And meanwhile, prayers are being said for Mary in Edinburgh. And it's a little bit difficult to tease out exactly the sequence of events because the letters do kind of cross a little bit, but this illness seems to wax and wane. So one minute she's very ill, then she seems to get better and then she gets ill again. And so this is exactly what we hear. By the 24th of October, William Maitland, who is one of Mary's counselors says, the queen has been so sick that her life is in danger. And the French ambassador reports, her whole body became so cold that those present thought she was dead. The Earl of Murray, who was her half brother, began to lay hands on the most, her most precious articles, such as her silver plate and rings. Charming bloke. Um, so Mary's pretty moribund this, this state. And, and it goes on to say, morning dresses were ordered and arrangements made for the funeral. So Mary's in a deep state of unconsciousness, of no obvious signs of life as far as we can tell. And then she starts to regain consciousness again. So she seems to be out of danger, but not so. A second letter, then um, a few days later from Bishop Leslie, one of her ardent supporters says, the queen began swooning again and failed in her sight. Her feet and knees were cold. Her majesty got some relief until about six hours in the morning on Friday when her majesty became dead and all her members cold, eyes closed, mouth fast and her feet and arms stiff and cold. Again, they thought she was dead, but by some miracle, her physician refused to give up on her. And he, who is a perfect man of his craft, so the letter says, would not give the matter over in that manner, but anew began to draw her knees, legs, arms and feet and the rest with such vehement torments, which lasted the space of three hours until Her Majesty recovered her sight and speech and got a great sweating, which was held as a relief of the sickness. Mary, from that point forward, recovered but it had indeed been her near-death experience. And obviously it made an impact on Mary because much, much later on when she was facing execution at Fotheringhay, she herself said, oh, would that I had died at Jebra. So what caused that? Well, um, I, I can't see my clock at the moment. Heather, can you tell me what I, how I'm doing on time? Please. You, yeah, no, absolutely. It's um, 7.35, 2.35, you're like 35 minutes in. 
Can I, can you bear with me for five or 10 minutes? Would that be okay? Absolutely, please. I think okay. people are loving it. The chat is so active. People are really enjoying it. Okay, cool. Great. Good. Super. Because it's e the next one's equally as exciting. So <laughs> I to miss that. But I won't go into what the cause of that was or what is debated. But if people want to ask me in the chat, I'm happy to come back to that because it is really interesting. So with that, let me find my little cursor again. Oh, that's, by the way, that is the back side of the same house. You get this nice view of this, this uh, tower house, lovely little gardens surrounding. It's just off the main street in Jedburgh. So really nice to go and visit that. And it does, and I said, I didn't get to see it for myself, but it's got the death mask of Mary Stuart as part of the uh, museum there. So yeah, really good place to visit. So now we are on to Holyrood House, the great Holyrood House. So again, I'd love to know if um, any of you folks have visited. And if you visited anywhere in Scotland, you've probably visited here or Edinburgh Castle because between them, they are just about the most popular tourist destinations uh, in Scotland. And, and not surprising, really, um, particularly from a Mary Stuart point of view, because it's got such a cornucopia of Stuart treasures. And as you'll hear in a moment, you can really get up close and personal to her story. But this house, Holyrood House, the Palace of Holyrood, this is how it looks today. It's still owned by the British monarchy. monarchy. Ugh, can't get my words out, monarchy. The Queen visits uh, for one week a year. Um, and um, it was, in fact, of all, probably, I was told when I was there, of all the places in Scotland, of all the palaces in Scotland, this was probably Mary's favourite. It was certainly the first place she laid her head at night when she returned to Scotland in August 1561. And it was a place of a great joy. She married her at that time, great love, Henry Lord Darnley, although was, we're not going to talk about it much today, but of course that very quickly fell apart spectacularly. And he is absolutely wrapped up in the you know, the really horrific and tragic events that we're going to be talking about in a moment, which of course was the murder of David Rizzio. And that all happened at Holyrood. So you've got, you know, you've got triumph and tragedy, you've got joy and despair all wrapped up in this one location. But before we get to that story, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the history, because I love talking about the history of how places evolve. I hope you find it interesting too. This is a drawing from the 16th century. I think it was the English who were attacking it or something to do with that in one of their incursions in Scotland. And they made a little, handily made a little sketch for us to enjoy. And as you can see, it says the King's Palace. Um, so here we have Holyrood. Now, originally there was no palace at Holyrood. Um, it was it was actually built around the monastery, the Abbey, the Abbey of Holyrood. Um, and that was founded by a very pious Scottish King, David I. Um, but as you can see, um, Holyrood lay outside of Edinburgh's city wall. So you imagine the city of Edinburgh is off to your right. You can't see the city walls and you can't see the rest of Edinburgh, but it's there. And so in fact, this abbey lay outside of the city walls it's surrounded by lovely countryside you've got arthur's seat which is the the kind of the the large outcrop of of ground which overlooks holyrood and so you can imagine that this place was full of clean fresh air out of the press of the city and so it became quite a popular get away from it uh, for Scottish monarchs. And they started to visit Holyrood quite regularly. And then they established a, a small palace there. And then the small palace got larger. And then eventually a semi-permanent residence uh, developed into a permanent residence. And this is what you really what it, it looked like. Uh, in the 16th century. I'm not entirely sure exactly when this is dated, but this gives you a very good impression of how it would have looked. So just under the, I don't know whether it's a two or a Z, but the little two or the Z, you can see the Abbey Church. And then to the left of that, you can see a courtyard, which has, I think it's 33 in the middle. You've got a big courtyard, 33. That's the base court or outer court. And then you have the little courtyard, 33. And that was the um, the palace that was essentially the, and it's a similar you know it's on essentially a very similar footprint uh, then as it is today you've got these four ranges surrounding a courtyard 
Um, uh, but I will say that the interiors have been vastly remodeled over time and whole whole rooms have been moved from one part of the palace to the other. So the interior is largely, um, the 16th century interior is largely lost, except this residential tower. So um, James V, if I can find my, where's my, where, there we are, there we are. So, um, so James V, as I say, that great Renaissance um, builder of Renaissance palaces, Mary's father, developed this tower that you can see. He was responsible for building this tower block. And this became the principal royal apartments, latterly for Mary, after she returned, certainly after she returned to Scotland. And um, as you can see there, um, just to point it out while we're looking at this slide, Mary's apartments were on the first, uh, Darnley's apartments were on the first floor. Now, I do know that if you're in the US, this is very confusing because we call the, I think your, our first floor is your second floor, I think. So um, the, the floor with the first range of windows <laughs> was Darnley's apartments and the floor with the second range of windows was Mary's apartments. And, and interestingly, and it is, this is a bit relevant to the story that we're about to come to, the tower block today is integral to the palace, so it's fully connected. You just walk from one room into the other. But in the 16th century, it stood as a separate tower block and you could only get access to it by a stone four stair that entered at first floor level. And there was all sorts of defensive features. So it was, Holyrood was not a fortified palace like Edinburgh Castle or Stirling Castle, but it did have a bit of a moat and it, you know, there were some obviously security was important. So there were some security features. So it should have been quite a secure place for Mary. Hmm. Well, that's unless you have a traitorous husband, as we will talk about in a moment. Um, OK, and just also to say, because it's relevant to the story, those two floors are connected by a stone spiral staircase, a privy stone spiral staircase. Ugh, can't get my words out, but you would you actually go up if you visit that tower today. So let's we're getting into the final leg of my talk. We're going to talk about that horrific horrendous event which occurred on the 9th of March 1565. It must have been one of the most terrifying events of Mary's life and of course as I said before that's the murder of her friend and secretary David Rizzio. Now this is a I think it's it's obviously late it looks Victorian to me and it's all very melodramatic but I, actually it was pretty dramatic. Um, this wasn't exactly how it happened but it does capture the spirit of, of the, the horror felt. So, um, yes, yeah, so what happened? Well, this is the man in question. This is David Rizzio. Um, as I say, he was her secretary. He was close to the Queen. He was a friend of the Queen. Now, there's a lot goes on around this that builds up to this moment of the murder of David Rizzio. We probably don't have time, or maybe we do in the questions, but I'm not going to go into great detail about that. But this unfortunate man, is, suffice to say, got himself entangled in the dangerous politics of 16th century Scotland. And of course, there was a huge amount of tension between Mary as a Catholic queen and her confederate lords who were Protestant. And they were always incredibly suspicious of what she was trying to do with religion and how she might be trying to foist Catholicism back on Scotland. Remember, Scotland had just become a Protestant country just a year before she'd arrived back in Scotland in 1561. OK, so all of these events happened in this chamber here. This is a drawing of Mary's bedchamber. It's on that um, first second <laughs> second floor of the tower you've got the bedchamber and you've got these smaller rooms or closets which and you can still go in this room today and it's a it's a small it's an intimate room so i think the energy of the place is held so well um and one of the upsides of being there during covid is actually of course they're restricting the number of people going through these buildings so normally i understand these rooms are absolutely jammed with people but in fact i actually got to stand in this bed chamber on my own uh which i think is quite a rare occurrence um now i'm going to talk to you about the events that happened on the 9th of march but once again i want to go back to contemporary accounts because there's nothing like contemporary accounts to give you the details. And there are two people who write about this within two or three weeks of this event occurring. So pretty fresh. 
One of them is the second Earl of Bedford, Francis Russell, who's like, he's based in Berwick, which is an, a northern English town close to the border with Scotland. And he's always kind of passing the gossip backwards and forwards and acts from time to time like an English ambassador to Scotland. And he reports on it. And then, of course, we have Mary herself, who is eyewitness to this, who writes in letters to the Bishop of Glasgow and the King of Queen of France exactly what happened. So we're going to hear it right from the horse's mouth. And again, I'm going to tell the events reading verbatim some of the quotes that are captured in those letters. So imagine here we are in this room in one of that small closet and it's seven in the evening. In fact, I'll probably just go forward a bit. Here we go. We're in this closet here because this is where this all starts. It's seven in the evening and the queen was, was in her words, in her cabinet, at our supper. And then according to Mary, Darnley entered and placed himself beside us at our supper. So she was obviously surprised. This time they were completely arranged. Um, um, they, hate, well, they hated each other. Um, estranged, they hated each other. And then at some point, Patrick Lord Ruthven, who is one of the Confederate Lords, armed, quote, armed in like manner with his accomplices, burst into her apartments and demanded to speak to Rizzio. Mary then asked Darnley, what do you know about this? And he says, nothing, 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 nothing to see here. Uh, but in fact, we know that it had been Darnley who had let these guys in through his ground floor, his first floor chambers, up his privy staircase and into Mary's apartment. So Mary then commanded Ruthven to leave. It was treason, get out. Um, and it was at this point, I think, that David Rizzio began to think something was amiss because he, for safeguard, took refuge behind Mary's back. Ruthven then turned on Rizzio and said that he should learn better. Now, he meant by this that he, basically they'd implicated uh, Rizzio as being a lover of Mary and not just a friend and a secretary, and that he'd overstepped his mark and that his relationship with the Queen was unacceptable. And then, offering to take him by the arm, David took the queen by the blights of her gown. So you may have heard how he hid behind Mary, clinging onto her gown. Meanwhile, Rufin, according to Mary, cast down the table. So he threw it aside and he violently put his hands on him, i.e. David, and quote, struck him over our shoulders with hangers, one part of them standing before our face with bended dags. A bended dag? is a cocked pistol. So that's the bit of the story when Mary basically has somebody pointing a pistol at her and her pregnant belly. Remember, she's what, six months pregnant by this time. So what then happens is that Darnley holds on to Mary's arms and Ruth and I think managed to drag uh, Rizzio out of the, this room, this cabinet, and through Mary's bedchamber and through the door beyond that you can see here, which leads beyond there into like a presence chamber or an outer chamber. And basically, um, Francis Russell reports that Mary, quote, would gladly have saved him, but the king having loosed his hands and holding her arms, then caused David to be thrust out of the cabinet through the bedchamber of presence. And then he goes on to say that uh, Lords Morton and Lindsay, uh, who were in this latter chamber, Chamber of Pleasance, actually had planned to hang Rizzio the next day. And this is the, this is the chamber we're talking about. Very COVID, you notice, with everybody's... Um, thingies, uh, face masks, but this is the, this is also part of the sequence of rooms and as you can see it is stuffed full of fantastic paintings and that jewel that you can see in that cabinet, I think that's one with the Lennox jewel, it's just I stood and was mesmerized by it for ages. Anyway, so this group of confederate lords have dragged Rizzio into this um, chamber and they planned to hang him but I think there was so much adrenaline and testosterone flying around that somebody thrust into the him, thrust him into the body with a dagger quote unquote and then it just unleashed it seemed to unleash the fury and Mary merely states that they took the secretary quote out of our cabinet and at the entry of our chamber gave him 56 strokes with winyards which were short swords and swords so daggers and swords and of course, this famously is the plaque that now exists in that very room that I've just shown you, which commemorates the murder of David Rizzio and the so-called, she says, 
rather skeptically, uh, blood upon the floor uh, that, that refuses to move. Um, and then maybe just to, to finish the story, um, here we have Mary, so it seems appropriate to finish with a picture of her, that Mary was certainly traumatized, that she actually says she was in, quote, extreme fear of her life. Uh, Ruth, and, Ruth and stalked back into her chamber and hurled accusations that the lords were highly offended with her proceedings and tyranny, and they found it intolerable, tolerable, and they had put her David to death. Well, Mary did escape, and that is another story. And again, I can happy to answer a few more questions about how she got out of that pickle, which was quite remarkable, and really remarkable, and something I'd never actually read until I went back to the contemporary story so, uh, sources. So I'm, I'm happy to finish that story.